Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. And I'm Mary Matte. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. A reminder to go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com to support the show and get bonus content. We have some great stuff this week, including a full breakdown of my run-in with Senator Chris Coons on a train, which got me ejected after I questioned him about his refusal to support a ceasefire in Gaza. You heard of uh, snakes on a plane? Well, you got a snake on a train. (laughs) Well, he certainly was slippery because uh, after refusing to answer my questions, he uh, asked that I be moved, and I was moved, and uh, then he got me kicked off. And we'll break it down fully in this week's Thursday Throwdown. We'll also go over many other mad clips from this week that we're not gonna have time to get to on the main show today so be sure to subscribe at usefulidiotspodcast.com yes you will not regret it all righty so should we start with the four basic food groups democrats suck republicans suck isn't that weird isn't that terrible yes for this week's democrats suck there was a rally in washington dc this week uh in solidarity with israel as it commits a mass killing campaign in gaza And among the people to take the stage was the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer. We are here united, Democrat and Republican, House and Senate, to say we stand with Israel. We stand with Israel. We stand. We stand. We stand. We stand, we stand, USA, 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 we are with Israel. Never again, never again, never again, never again. Well, what a rousing speech and those chants of we stand with Israel, USA, and of course, Never again, because we have to, of course, exploit the Nazi Holocaust to justify this current genocidal campaign by Israel in Gaza. But I've never seen Chuck Schumer so riled up. Obviously, the opportunity to support killing Palestinians in Gaza is exciting for him. And he pumped up the crowd. He certainly was he certainly was excited. I mean, it was a little awkward in terms of rhythm, (laughs) but their hearts obviously in the right place. Yes, and just to underscore how bipartisan this is, Chuck Schumer then joined hands with Mike Johnson, the new Republican Speaker of the House, along with Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic Minority Leader. And they once again chanted, we stand with Israel. 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 Israel. We stand with Israel. So touching. And yes, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention Joni Ernst, the senator, was also there. So showing off their bipartisan unity in support of Israel, which shows that really for all the talk of divisions in Washington, if there's one thing that brings both parties together, it's the opportunity to support killing innocent Palestinian civilians inside Gaza. It's really beautiful. And we have a bonus Democrat at this Stand with Israel rally, and that is none other than the senator from Pennsylvania, a guy who billed himself as a working class champion, draping himself in the flag of Israel, and that is Senator John Fetterman. Check out that flag. It's covering, he, he's a big guy, and it's covering his yeah. whole body. Yeah, that's like an extra large flag. Yeah, I wonder if you had that custom made. Yeah, me too. I wonder if he brought it, or do you think someone like put it on him? I'm going to guess he brought it. I mean, he... Uh. Last week, he was seen waving an Israeli flag outside Congress after some anti-war veterans were being arrested. And they were like, Senator Fetterman, like, support a ceasefire. And he responded just by walking out waving his little Israeli flag. So he goes from the little Israeli flag to the big Israeli flag. Well, hey, maybe he was afraid that he was going to be accosted by uh, Dan Kovalik again. Remember when he asked him why he wasn't supporting a ceasefire and he had him thrown out of the bar? Maybe he thought this would give him, like, special powers and uh, protect him. He's covering himself from Dan Kavalik. Yeah, that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, Solkan, uh, who is a Jewish anti-Zionist rapper, 
tweeted out, he looks like a superhero that only fights children and hospital workers. <laughs> Pretty accurate. <laughs> he does have a name for a superhero because, you know, Batman, Superman, Fetterman. Oh, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Zion, Zion Man. Zion Man. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. his power is used for evil, not right. on the side of good. That's so awful. Well, keeping it with the uh, pro-Israel rally, let's hear what Mike Johnson, uh, Speaker of the House, uh, Mike Johnson had to say at this rally. The calls for a ceasefire are outrageous. It's just so beautiful to hear people with such an overtly pro-violent chant. Mike Johnson says a ceasefire is outrageous. I mean, that's such an outrageous statement. And I'm curious for other 80s babies out there, people who grew up in the 80s. When I hear the word outrageous, I cannot help but think of the theme song for Jim. Right. Jam outrageous, is truly outrageous. Truly, truly, truly outrageous. So that's what I hear every time I hear the word outrageous is, you know, ceasefires are truly outrageous. Truly, 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 truly outrageous. outrageous. So maybe yeah. he's pro because that was a pro gem song. That so was maybe song. he's actually pro ceasefire and they didn't get it. Mm, interesting. Interesting theory. Okay. Well, Mike Johnson looks like he's a, you know, he, he, he could have come of age during the gem era. So maybe that's, maybe sending us a secret message. Yeah. He's with truly outrageous. Friend. Truly outrageous. Yeah. We should rehabilitate uh, Jem, turn her into a pro-Palestine uh, superhero. Speaking of superheroes, yeah. Was she a I'm superhero? She was not a superhero. She was just a musician, but she had a kind of a superhero vibe to her. Yeah, she could transform into Jem, and no one ever noticed that. You know, so that in that respect, it was a superhero thing. Oh, okay, so she was, yeah. Yeah. All right. See, so you get your cultural criticism at this show too. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's go on to Isn't That Weird and turning to the Senate. There was a recent hearing where Team Series leader Sean O'Brien was testifying. And Senator Mark Wayne Mullen, who's a Republican of Oklahoma, decided to challenge him to a fight. And this was awkward for the chair of this hearing, Bernie Sanders, who had to remind him that he happens to be serving as a U.S. senator. Tim and I kind of had a back and forth. I uh, appreciate your demeanor today. It's quite different. But after you left here, you got pretty excited about the keyboard. In fact, you tweeted at me one, two, three, four, five times. And let me read what the last one said. Um, it said, look at the people behind him, by the way. They look, <laughs> one of them looks so bored. Okay. Greedy CEO who pretends like he's self made. Sir, I wish you was in the truck with me when I was building my plumbing company myself and my wife was running the office because I sure remember working pretty hard in long hours. Pretends like he's self-made. What a clown. Fraud. Always has been. Always will be. Quit the tough guy act in these Senate hearings. You know where to find me. Any place, any time, cowboy. Sir, this is a time, this is a place. You want to run your mouth? We can be two consenting adults. We can finish it here. Okay, that's fine. Perfect. You want to do it now? I'd love to do it right now. Well, stand your butt up then. You stand your butt up. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold, stop it. Is that your solution? Every poll. No, no. Sit down. Sit down. Look at you. You know, you're a United States senator. Sit down. Active. Oh, okay, okay. Sit down, please. All right. Can I respond? Mr. Hold Jim. it. Hold it. If hold we can, no, I have the mic. Said. I'm sorry. This is hold what it. he said. You'll have your time. Okay. Can I respond? Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> this is a hearing, and God knows the American people have enough of contempt for Congress. Let's not. I don't make like it worse. thugs and you, bullies. You have, and you have I don't like you because you just described yourself. Uh, hold it. <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> kind of fun though. I mean, uh, hey, that adds some excitement to otherwise usually uh, boring hearings, and. I don't support violence. I don't condone fighting, but I do appreciate the threat of it in a Senate hearing. I think that is pretty entertaining. 
speaking of uh, really awkward moments like that, my isn't that terrible is Pastor John Hagee being one of the speakers at the pro-Israel rally. Let's take a look at what Mike Hagee had to say at this pro-Israel rally. Israel is the shining city on the hill. Israel says, God says of Israel, Israel is my firstborn son. Jerusalem is the city of God. Jerusalem is the shoreline of eternity. Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel today and forever. So it's already weird for a pro-Israel rally that's organized by, uh, in, in large part, um, Jewish Americans. It's already weird that they're having this evangelical pastor who believes in um, the end times, right? Because according to people like Hagee, Jews need to go back to Israel to fulfill uh, the prophecy and we need to go back there and then everyone who doesn't accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior uh, will burn in eternal damnation. So he's not really a Jewish ally, but he does support the settlements. His organization, KUFI, Christians United for Israel, actually uh, sends money to settlements. But what makes this extra awkward is that he actually has said some very offensive things, not just about Jews going back to Israel so the Antichrist can come and... Uh, bring on Armageddon, he said that Hitler was part of God's plan. So let's take a look at this sermon he delivered. Theodor Herzl is the father of Zionism. He was a Jew that after the turn of the 19th century said, this land is our land. God wants us to live there. So he went to the Jews of Europe and said, I want you to come and join me in the land of Israel. So few went. Herzl went into depression. Those who came founded Israel. Those who did not went through the hell of the Holocaust. Then God sent a hunter. A hunter is someone who comes with a gun and he forces you. Hitler was a hunter. And the Bible says, Jeremiah writing, they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill out of the holes of the rocks, meaning there's no place to hide. And that will be offensive to some people. Well, dear heart, be offended. I didn't write it. Jeremiah wrote it. It was the truth and it is the truth. How did it happen? because God allowed it to happen. Why did it happen? Because God said, my top priority for the Jewish people is to get them to come back to the land of Israel. So there you have it. These are the political bedfellows of the people who organized this rally. Someone who says that Hitler was part of God's plan because God's greatest priority is to get the Jews to Israel. Jeremiah wrote it. It's in the book. Yeah, Jeremiah don't, wrote it down. Don't blame I, I, didn't, yeah, I don't see the words Hitler coming from Jeremiah. I don't see Jeremiah writing that that we're, there was going to be a genocidal maniac who was going to try to exterminate all the Jews, and that's somehow a good thing and part of God's plan. But that's why Hagee's a professional. He's exactly. a professional right. religious, religious person. I'm just a lowly lay, journalist. Lay person. Yeah, you're, yeah. La you're a member of the laity. You need to watch more Hagee. Then you'd get it. I do love in that video, for people who couldn't see it, who are just listening to the show, there's footage of people listening to Hagee's uh, preaching and they're trying to follow along in the bible and it's like <laughs> he's talking about how it's part of god's plan that hitler tried to exterminate the jews and it's like people trying to follow along in the bible are going to be confused because it's right. not really actually right. looking not, for hitler where is he hitler is there an yeah. index here we can check yeah. yeah what's interesting is that any single person affiliated with any pro-palestinian march who says anything problematic is used to discredit the entire pro-palestine movement discredit the call for ceasefire, but you can actually have an open bigot, because of course Hagee's also very homophobic, but you can have an open bigot uh, who suggests that, no, who doesn't suggest, who states that Hitler was sent by God, you can have him be an official speaker, and that's okay. Why isn't Schumer being asked to condemn him? Like, that's a great it's, point. It, you, you can say, you can have Hagee part of your rally, but you can't chant from the river to the sea. I think everyone who, who spoke at that rally should be censured by Congress for speaking alongside someone who said that Hitler was sent by God. And then they lecture other people about being anti-Semites. Anyway, so that's my terrible, and I'm sticking to it. For this week's guest, we are joined by Rachma Zain. She is a podcast host based in Egypt 
Her podcast is called The Arab Narrative. And Rachma recently went viral after she came across CNN's Clarissa Ward at the Rafah border crossing between Egypt and Gaza. And Rachma challenged Clarissa Ward about CNN's coverage of the Israeli attack on Gaza. So we're going to speak to Rachma about that, as well as many other aspects when it comes to the current Gaza crisis and the media's coverage of it. Rachma, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I want to go to a clip. You went viral uh, confronting Clarissa Ward, who was a journalist with CNN, at the Rafah crossing uh, from Egypt into Gaza. And this is some of your exchange. Where are your condemnation? Where is your channel covering this? Cover this. Say the truth. We understand you're an employee. You're just a puppet. You're just a mouthpiece. Come talk to me like a human being. Come talk to me like a human being. Thank you. I understand you have your foreign policy. No, I've heard you. I've heard you. You hear me. I understand you have your foreign policy. I understand you speak for your government. I understand you represent your government. But that being said, you're a country that claims free speech. Your customized democracy is actually what led to him. And now we are watching an occupation and we are watching the result of your silence, of your misrepresentation of Arabs. I know you're probably tired of talking about it, but it's a really important moment because this is the first time during this phase of the Gaza crisis that CNN has been called out directly for its coverage. And there's been so much criticism. They embed with Israeli forces into Gaza. They parroted the lie about the dozens of beheaded babies. They constantly repeat Israeli government talking points. They uh, play the victim card. They talk so much always about how Jewish people in America are the real victims here, not the people of Gaza. So for a lot of people, this confrontation you had was, uh, this exchange you had was cathartic. Talk to us about what was happening there uh, at that moment in Rafa on the crossing when you I uh, came across Cl- a Clarissa Ward. So I, I'm not tired of talking about it because I haven't really been talking about it. And even a lot of Egyptians are not, have taken it as a sort of, it's, it's, I don't like to um, talk about the encounter so much because there is a bigger issue at stake here. There is a bigger issue to actually talk about, which is the fact that this is an occupation. It's not a war. And the rhetoric, is so dangerous the narrative is so dangerous and this is why the confrontation happened because we had been seeing so much from western media um using wrong terminology and when you use wrong terminology it gives you it gives you a depiction of what's happening that's not the truth it's a manipulation of what's happening so for example you would read um headlines by the new york times that says uh 500 palestinians killed who killed them and then when it comes to the other party they're they're like hamas has slaughtered and and the kind of jargon that's used is very manipulative and we understand the danger of that for the west because at the end of the day you know you you i i don't know how to I, I, it, I forget uh, the translation in English, but it's like the, the head of the cobra sort of. So like the tail is the media, but the big, um, the, the, where the venom really is, is within U.S. politics. And it's true. Uh, and, and we've seen, and not just U.S. Pro- within, uh, that's sort of pushed by Zionist lobbyists who are very powerful in the U.S. And you'd think it was just the Republicans. But unfortunately, we're seeing that that same um, clutch is held over the Democrats as well. And we are now in the region suffering from that, the the excessive meddling and then the excessive meddling. And then when there's a reaction, it's aided by Western media to be painted out to be an action, not a reaction. And so... I'm so sorry, I don't want to deviate from your question. You had said, what was I doing there? That is important to note. So what I was doing there, I was at the Rafah crossing because there is is a misconception that Egypt isn't allowing to open the border. It's not allowing the supplies. It's not allowing Palestinians into Sinai. It's just, it's key messages that we keep on hearing that are just so far from the truth. The issue is, we were, I was there with the Egyptian food bank uh, volunteers had been there previous. Uh, Two thirty a.m. You start hearing merciless bombardment 
by Israel. It's three kilometers away, merciless bombardment. Like your tents shake. You wake up. I, I, there was the United, uh, there was the United Nations meeting to try and see the situation and try and urge Israel to allow these supplies in because not only were they not allowing the supplies in, they bomb the crossing from Rafah into Gaza, so that even when the they would allow the supplies in, you have the the roads are completely broken off and these huge trucks aren't able to to enter. It's it's. It's pure evil. And then, so I'm so I'm there for the United Nations um, conference. And then I saw the reporter who, interestingly enough, wasn't there over the nights prior to seriously see what's happening. She was there with the United Nations convoy, which is already a bigger bias as it is. You're there with the, why aren't the other channels with the with the United Nations? Why is it that CNN is is the one with the with the United Nations? And then when I saw it, it wasn't interesting the encounter itself. It was interesting to see after the encounter on CNN the report that was given. They took a sound bite out of me to show this, you know, cliche emotional Arab talking about the children and not everything else that came with it and like just these thirty seconds of that. And then she stated that she was surprised that there were people protesting. And she seemed to be surprised that there were people protesting at the border. Had you done your due diligence, had you been there at the border to see what was happening, to see that Israel was closing off all these supplies, you yourself would have been protesting. What what did they leave out, by the way, of the exchange? Then we'll move on from this. But I think this is an important example of media um, behavior. What did they leave out? Like, what had just happened? Was it that they cut stuff out at the beginning or the end? Interestingly enough, uh, I don't believe that she was planning on coming to speak to me initially. It was because they it dawned on her that there were other people that took footage of me trying to tell her, you know, come speak to me, come speak to me. And then uh, that was taken. So when that was taken... Um, she sort of then wanted to appease the situation. So then she came over and started speaking to me. Interestingly enough, it was then taken on CNN that she was like, she came to hear the people, to, to listen to their woes. You know, that's her, sort of American savior. Like, look at, look at, look at these emotional people. Let us hear them out. You know, that, that sort of rhetoric that we're so sick of. And so, so that part, and also the the not understanding why there were protests and 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 then the other thing is everything else was taken off so for example when i talked about the the mouthpieces are are complete are puppets basically because they're just representing us foreign policy that is backing israel no matter what it does no matter what it does and, and that has been exposed because people are like, are suddenly realizing where their tax dollars are going. Why are we paying so much for Israel? There needs to be a revision of its whole history in order to really understand what's going on today. And that's, that's what I believe has dawned on a lot of people in the West, that they really need to check. So what was happening in 1918, 1948. Who is Theodore Herzl? What what is this? Why is the the state of why is the state of Israel? Why? So a lot of these questions have sort of started because they're seeing so much bias from Western media. So it's actually funny. The irony is they were trying to hide the truth, and in so doing, it got people curious to look for other outlets because a lot of people had seen the CNN as the most credible, you know? We'd see it as as prestigious. The CNN is prestigious. The BBC is prestigious. The New York Times is prestigious. So obviously, whatever they say, it, it's taken seriously. And that's so dangerous because when you call it a war, that in itself is dangerous for the Palestinians. It is an occupation. It was, it was an armed group that attacked Israel and got a, 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 a reaction out of that that was that did not justify the act that was done. Because Israel has told you it's a war and you saw the headlines at the very beginning. 
war, war, war. Sort of preparing for what's to come. It's not a war. It's right. a it's an assault. I mean, Hamas is not Hamas doesn't have planes. Hamas doesn't even have air defenses. It's just an outright massacre going on. And the the the, the word war sort of suggests that it had, these are two equal sides when it's really just an exactly. occupation attacking the people it's occupying. What do you think a responsible media would include when covering this issue? A responsible media? That is yeah. an excellent question. Go to Gaza. If the Israeli forces will allow you, go to Gaza. Like these these twenty year olds, like Vai Plessy and Ma, Ma, and and Wissam and and uh, Ma'taz, these these people, these are journalists. There was one journalist whose whole family yeah. got killed, and he needed to to report right there, and he was reporting the death of his own family. So the journalists are the victims. And the press jacket, and we've seen it before. It's not the first time that Israeli occupation attacks journalists because they're the ones that are going to tell you the truth. What is happening now in Gaza? Fuel is running out. What does that mean? Communication is going to be shut off. They want to kill them in the dark. So this is why it is so imperative to have credible media. And report what you see. I'm not telling you, say this, speak out for the Palestinian plight. Go to Gaza. To that reporter, be be at the Rafah crossing. Really listen to what's happening. And also another narrative that's super dangerous is why doesn't Egypt uh, give the Palestinians yeah, exactly. Sinai? Go to a Palestinian and ask them if they want to go to Sinai. And that Palestinian will look you from the tip of their nose and tell you why. Why should I leave my home to go to the home of another? Palestinians don't want to leave their land. So two things here. You do this. One, the Palestinian cause gets totally ruined. Israel occupies the rest of the land. Two, you will have Israeli forces in Egypt. Because then they're just going, because, because look at it. An armed force hit at Israel, they waged a war. So what if another armed uh, uh, force hits at Israel? They're going to wage a war in Egypt? So protecting Sinai is imperative. Palestinians having their land is even more imperative. They don't want Sinai. So this rhetoric, why doesn't Egypt give them Sinai? It's so, it's so audacious to say that. It's so audacious to say that. As if, for example, um, Aaron is like, oh, I, 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 someone is bombing my house. I'm like, why don't you just go to someone else's house? It's a supremacist mentality, you know, that you have the right to dictate what I should then do. Why it's and it's also as if you're telling the Palestinians, why aren't you accepting what Israel is doing? Just go somewhere else. Yep. Or don't you say you're tight knit with all of the rest of the Arabs? Why don't they take you? And it's so hypocritical because at one point, especially Eastern European Jews, during the atrocities that were happening to them, they had nowhere to go. They had nowhere to go. So you're seeing things that are so blatantly hypocritical and ironic that you just have, there's no smart jargon now to use and, and the suits and the panels to start speaking about the situation. All of that has been deemed useless and farcical. All of, the, all of these institutions that we used to put on a pedestal and say, ah, the United Nations. What is the United Nations there for? To avoid these kinds of humanitarian atrocities. And yet here we are. And I and it's it's just it just goes to show that the Zionist movement has its tentacles not only in major industries, but with thought leaders, with uh, major politicians, with media outlets. So it is like what I said at the border: who's left to speak up for the Palestinians? And when you went on uh, Piers Morgan's show to talk about your exchange with Clarissa Ward, he started the interview by basically asking you if you wanted to apologize. Let's. A clip of that. You were on CNN. I know Clarissa Ward, the correspondent that you were uh, very passionate towards. In, in my opinion, having worked at CNN, she is one of the best foreign correspondents in the world. And I felt uh, absolutely has tried to straddle uh, this very tricky line of reporting fairly and accurately on what is a, a horrendous conflict. Um, when you look back at yourself in that exchange with Clarissa, how do you feel about the way that you uh, addressed her? Do you have any regret? 
or do you feel you could have expressed yourself differently or do you feel it, it accurately represented how you were feeling? I'm not going to waste my time talking about the report with Clarissa uh, because this takes away from the point you mentioned before there was a deadlock in the debate. There's no deadlock in the debate. There is terror in the debate. You are unable to debate with Israel because what's happened so far is we're witnessing the sick relationship between the United States and Israel where basically uh, the United States has given uh, a permission for Israel to uh, have genocide on ground. And what's happened is we're seeing uh, no one can say no to Israel. The United Nations isn't able to say no to Israel without repercussions. Uh, media in, media figures aren't able to say no to Israel without uh, without repercussions. So what ends up happening is that you're basically raising a spoiled brat you're unable to say no to that has now grown up to be a sociopath. Now, in response, you steered the question the question to what's going on in Gaza because it's such a ridiculous question. But I I'm just curious. I mean, what did you think when he was when he tried to suggest to you that you should apologize to Clarissa Ward of CNN? We should ask you if you're going to apologize to Pierce Morgan. I'm just kidding. I was genuinely, genuinely amused. But also, it, it, another thing that amused me even more, when I was talking about the bias of Western media and how problematic that was, and he was like, and he suddenly, and this is something I've seen before in a lot of interviews. Hey, I'm, I got you here. I got you to speak. How many pro-Palestinians have I got? And in him doing so, he exposed that there was a bias in him stating that he's been the, 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 the outlet for Palestinians. He exposed that there's bias elsewhere. So he sort of, in a way, reiterated what I was saying, that there is an issue that people who speak up for Palestine are accosted on air. I see these interviews where Palestinian people speaking for people speaking even with history are not allowed to speak. They're accosted midway and, and they're not listened to. It's not an interview. I'm not listening to you. I'm just waiting to, to attack you or to wait for you to, you know, I always say this. If you are waiting to get insulted, you will get insulted. And these are the sort of interviews we're seeing where people are, where these interview hosts are taking it very personally. You taking something like this personally is not just selfish and, and, and wrong, it's so hindering to a real problem, a real humanitarian problem where people are, 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 are on edge or are, are seeing complete misrepresentation, which is amounting to right now, what is the death toll? Over 11,000 Palestinians dead, how many are under the rubble? Such atrocities that you can't even fathom how then certain media outlets are A, covering it up, B, not allowing uh, people to speak up, so when you see an interview like this where someone is giving themselves a pat on the back for bringing out people to speak on Palestine, obviously you're you're just, you you want to, what is it called when you do that face bomb? What is it? A face young? bomb? Yes, that one. Yeah. He's damning the media with faint praise. And I mean, he's pointing out how what makes his show unique is that he has Palestinian guests on or guests who, who are uh, supporting the Palestinian people. Uh, Butch does speak to what the inherent bias, which is that other networks, this default is you have someone defending Israel and there's no one else there. Um, in, in terms of the media framing, though, so you said that journalists should go to Gaza. Um, barring that, given that it can be a death sentence to be a journalist there, what do you think the media needs to be doing in terms of framing? So like we constantly see like Pierce Morgan does the well, you condemn Hamas. Um, you have these different talking points, right? Israel has the right to defend itself. What are What is the context that the media should be providing that they're not providing or the questions they should be asking that they're not asking? That's a very good point. So I was talking to Yoro Aid, she's a Palestinian journalist, and she was telling me about this. She was telling me how um, she'd be speaking to outlets and she lost over 40 members of her family. And the first thing they do is ask her, do you condemn Hamas? It's as if I'm not even thinking. First of all, as a journalist, you're supposed to study the person you're going to interview. Okay. That's ABC journalism. I'm supposed to study who you are, if you've had recent events, and take that into account. Even if I'm going to ask you to condemn Hamas. But it's not about, it's how you ask, it's how you ask your question. 
study first. Maybe you, and also there has to be a curiosity as a journalist. I actually want to know what's happening. So when there are interviews that I'm watching where people who start to speak about what's happening in Palestine are given 30 seconds before they're interrupted, well, you're not listening. You're not listening. You need to listen. So listening is something. I can't believe I'm saying listening is something. So journalists ought to listen. Yes, you ought to listen. You ought to not interrupt people who start to speak about Palestine. Christina Amanpour, who I used to put on such a pedestal when she was talking to Hazem Zomno, she, her, with her finger, you know, with her index finger, which is quite impolite in our country, I feel. And, and she's like, but do you listen to him first? Ask him, but listen to him first. You're, you're supposed to be a seasoned journalist. So also, it's interesting. Uh, when this was happening, I had someone who works in CNN before I was at the Rafa Crossing tell me, hey, do you know anybody who can speak for Palestine? We need to just bring someone on board. You haven't even studied who are the proper spokespeople, who's on ground, who's in Gaza, who's in the West Bank. They haven't even studied the geography of Palestine. And in studying the geography of Palestine, you're going to realize the the, cata the catastrophe that Israel did, I think it was either uh, 69 or even uh, before that, when they just sort of divided Palestinians so that they'd be as, it's a divide and conquer strategy. Just in knowing the geography, you're going to have a historical backdrop because you're going to ask yourself why. Journalists need to start asking themselves why. Or if you are in the studio and you are being given a certain script, revise your script. So there was also another CNN uh, news anchor who talked about the beheading of babies, although I shouldn't really reprimand her, reprimand her because the United States president came out and said that he saw beheaded children. And he mentioned it again, by the way. This and he week. mentioned it again recently. Yeah. Does it get, if I am doing a dark comedy, I wouldn't write this in because I feel like it's a little bit over the top. It is a ridiculous, Ridiculous situation. So when I have the U.S. president saying something like this, why should I reprimand a, a, a mediocre uh, news anchor who's who's who had a clip of her uh, running in the hotel in a hotel room, which is again so amusing. She's in Tel Aviv or something, and she's running, and she's like, "I'm so scared." I'm. You're in a hotel room. You have a running bath. You you have water. I see, I see the, the thing you use to blow dry your hair. Are, are you kidding me? <laughs> Just, I'm shocked. It's getting to a point where people who see the truth are just stunned. So, sorry, back to my point. I deviated. Okay. It's just... No, it's so, all relevant. It's all relevant what you're saying. So. So, so, so she came out and said the whole thing about beheaded babies. Now, dear Sarah... Why is it dangerous to have such a lie? Hmm. Because later you also have a rise in Islamophobia. And I like I prefer to call it Arabophobia because you you we, we are right. Christian as well. Right. And and you just see these Arabs that are getting attacked, you know. I think Aaron, you you also had told me about this again, about the the, the young Palestinian kid who was killed in the US. So you're you're encouraging hate crime. So even as a journalist, you know. You get this piece of news, what do you do? You don't you don't want to be you shouldn't want to be sensational. So you get views, you get you there has to be some moral compass of me. Yeah, if I say beheaded babies, it's gonna go viral. But let me take five minutes to fact check. How am I gonna do that? I'm not just taking my news, my 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 raw material of news from the studio. I also have, this is ABC journalists. You should have your own sources. You should have your own sources on ground. Hey, uh, Fadi, hey, Ahmed, you're in Palestine. We're hearing about this beheaded babies. Do you have something? Let me know. Uh, what are your officials saying? What are the people saying? So if you're not taking into account what everyone is saying, all parties, all facets, because at the end of the day, if I'm looking at something from this angle, you're looking at it from this angle. My job as a journalist is to give you the 360 degree angle. So you decide who you're going to be standing for. I'm not telling you they should be mouthpieces and tell you, save Palestine. Palestine ought to be free, which I definitely believe. However, in this case, I'm not a journalist. But as a journalist, you should say, well, you know, 
this UN, uh, this illegal act happened, this illegal act happened, uh, this uh, Palestinian journalist was killed, uh, over 30 Palestinian journalists were killed. No, 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 no. And I say the numbers, I give you the facts, I give you the whole, even if I say, even if I say, Palestinians say this, this person says this, and then you decide. Give, give people, you know what? Western media at this point is disrespectful of its own people. Give yeah. people the respect of knowing the truth and then deciding for themselves. Why are you deciding for them? And it all goes back to the Zionist control. APEC, millions, everyone in their pocket. To that extent, greed has dictated your moral compass that is so sad. Then I don't, you know something? Despite everything that's happening to the Palestinians, despite the mothers holding lifeless children, despite the pain we see when adults are themselves scared and hurt that they're unable to console children whose whole families are under rubble, despite all of that, I don't feel sorry for the Palestinians. I don't feel sorry for the Palestinians. Why do you not feel sorry for them? Can you elaborate on what you were just yes. saying? I don't feel sorry for the Palestinians. I do feel sorry for the people who are manipulating the truth. I do feel sorry for people who are looking at these children and have and would have a different perspective if these children were their own. As human beings, we need to have empathy for one another. It is so important. And I, I I'm I'm really the last one to be the, you know, the we always joke about these um the beauty pageants where, where the women come out and say, We want world peace, you know. But I, I really, really do mean it. It's, it hurts when we've been dehumanized for so long that children from the Arab world, from the African world, are seen as lesser than. It really hurts. And it's so, the, the injustice is painful. And to see that the problem you have is the parallel. What's happening? In Palestine, parallel to that, what's happening in the rest of the world. This is what's always scary to see. So when you have these kinds of atrocities on ground where you are, when you are watching videos and, and Palestinians are telling you, we are, sh we, are, we are showing you our deaths, our tragedies, we are recording this. And then you have on the other side, because you have the evidence, it's all there, there's no point even regurgitating it because it's there. And then when you have that, and then when you have parallel to that, people who are, are denying the basic rights, denying a ceasefire, how cruel could you be? Not only that, you don't just have that the Palestinians are being killed. You don't just have um, arrest with, in, with full impunity, in the, in, especially in the West Bank. You don't just have these. You also have that Palestinians have their electricity cut off, their communication cut off. If this was a war, how is Israel so hands-on when it comes to their communication, their electricity, and the supplies coming in and out? And you dare call it a war? No water. They're drinking almost sewage water now. No food. You're starving them? You're starving them and bombing them? This is This is... A genocide would be a kindness to what's happening. And to think, to think, you know, and this is something I say, and I, I always say it because my great-great-grandmother was Jewish, so I can say this, but I always say, I believe that Israel is one of the most anti-Semitic entities there ever was, ever. Jews, Christians, Muslims lived great under it was an empire under the Ottoman Empire, but we were fine. The Jews of Iraq, some of the most beautiful Jews out there. The Jews of Egypt. As soon as the creation of Israel and they started speaking in the name of Judaism and committing such atrocities in the name of Judaism, they started pitting everyone against each other. We were in the in this region, we weren't the ones. Who were who were who were creating the Holocaust and 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 having the pogrom? 
It was Eastern European Jews and, the, and Western Europeans. Eastern Europeans may have been worse, but, but it wasn't in our region. And this is what a lot of Palestinians are saying. And, and the thing is, it's always interesting when I see Germany carrying the guilt for what it's done historically. You should, by the way. You should carry the guilt. But I don't see Britain carrying that same guilt. I don't see Britain, after they didn't even consult with the people of Palestine, to bring in thousands of Jewish settlers from Europe, so a different culture, a different understanding, over to the people of Palestine. They never consulted the people of Palestine. They just sent over ships. They had their mandate. And they and they sort of and then in a series of events and also you had um, and you had the thing is Zionists have this tunnel vision they're they're very smart they understood the importance of the parallel that I was speaking about you had Golda Meir the this this honestly effective woman go to Europe tell tell them you know what give us give us the funding give us the weapons we're gonna we're gonna take care of the region here you go why aren't you carrying that guilt. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. That was great. Great to speak to Rachma. And again, her podcast is called The Arab Narrative. Now, even though she does not want to be an influencer, she is on Instagram and we'll link to her profile there. And make sure, if you haven't, make sure you subscribe because you're definitely going to want to see this week's Thursday Throwdown starring Aaron J. Mate himself none That's other me. than Aaron J. Mate. yeah yes we do a thorough breakdown of my exchange with senator chris coons on an amtrak train which got me kicked off eventually when i questioned him about the uh war on gaza and uh a lot more hilarity in this week's thursday throwdown all right see you next week bye thanks so much for listening to and watching useful idiots for extended episodes, bonus content, and our weekly Thursday Throwdown episode, please subscribe at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. Support the show for free by subscribing on YouTube, Rumble, and wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to rate and review. You can also follow us on Twitter at UsefulIdiotPod. Thanks for supporting independent media. We'll see you next time.